glucose spikes or the rapid increase in blood glucose, blood sugar, has garnered some attention for being potentially dangerous for our cardiovascular health. And many influencers have been rather bold in their declaration. And that really goes for both sides of the equation. Those that fear glucose spikes are a menace to society, beating up old ladies, and those that consider it a laughable to even consider. So what's the deal here? Is my daily apple really keeping the doctor away? Across eight studies and a few more, the answer is far less certain than people are making it out to be. For example, in this extensive scientific review, the researchers point out a host of different mechanisms by which glucose spikes cause harm to your body. One of the major pathways is called the rage pathway, which actually reminds me a lot of the game Doom, as if it's this uh, mode activated by Doom guy, like a, a demon voice saying, rage pathway, yeah. And then the Doom music starts playing every time you have a glucose spike. If you've never played Doom, you have no idea what I'm talking about. Anyway, this uh, rage pathway is a receptor called the rage receptor embedded in the membrane of your cells. When you have a glucose spike, this mass influx of glucose in your blood is spontaneously linked to different molecules in your body, creating these complex molecules called AGEs or advanced glycation end products. These AGEs bind to the rage receptor, which activates the cell through the receptor signaling to signaling proteins within the cell to activate. So, for example, the AGEs bind to the exterior section of the rage receptor, which leads to a shift in the receptor, which is sensed inside the cell, which leads to the tagging or activation of a cascade of proteins from a protein RAF, which then activates MEK or MEK, which then activates ERK or ERK and so on until it activates proteins that are called transcription factors. These transcription factors enter the nucleus of your cells where your genes are kept and bind them, encouraging to be read and produced into new proteins. However, these proteins are pro-inflammatory in nature like uh, interleukins and tumor necrosis factor alpha. Doesn't sound too good, does it? And as a reminder, that's just one mechanism. I'll describe a bit more in a little while, but I wanted to give myself an excuse to talk about the uh, rage pathway because let's be honest, that's a pretty cool sounding pathway and it's highly activated from glucose spikes. Okay, so not good, but let's look at some data, not just mechanisms. In this study, the researchers took participants that were perfectly healthy insulin sensitive individuals and pulsed glucose gave them glucose spikes over several hours every two hours then they measured the very same inflammatory markers that we just went over tumor necrosis factor alpha interleukins over the same time here's that data you'll note we're looking at three different measurements interleukin 6 up top tumor necrosis factor alpha in the middle and interleukin 18 on the bottom these are inflammatory proteins. Now, if we bring in the glucose spikes data, you'll note that massive spike at zero, two hours, and four hours. And if we reference that against the inflammation data, we see that one hour after the first spike, there's an increase in all three markers. Then it drops back down until one hour after the two hour spike and so on. So this data shows a relationship between glucose spikes and increased inflammatory markers, confirming some of the mechanistic story that I mentioned to you earlier. But this is extremely short-term data. And uh, I mean, there are plenty of studies that show things like exercise increase blood pressure in the short term, but that doesn't mean that it's a heart disease risk because long-term data indicates a net benefit of exercise on cardiovascular health. So. Is this a similar story? Well, if we return to this scientific review, the researchers point out a series of different studies. Here's a list. And don't worry, you don't need to analyze this. I'll spoil the plot. The majority of the studies showed an increased cardiovascular disease risk with increased postprandial glucose, which means that when people consume glucose, sugar, the higher their blood glucose post-consumption, the greater the associated risk of heart disease. Some of these studies lasted over two decades too. So do we now have our long-term data? No, 
we don't, which might surprise you. But this data sounds like it's the same thing that we're discussing, but it isn't. And this is where people are getting confused because they conflate the glucose spikes occurring on a glucose monitor with the relationship outlined in these studies. What do I mean? All of these studies are creating a relationship between a structured glucose consumption test called an oral glucose tolerance test and the risk of cardiovascular disease. However, when people are looking at their glucose spikes using their monitors, they are simply looking at the glucose at its highest point and assuming some negative outcome. They are not the same. One, the glucose tolerance test is measured glucose over a two hour period. So it's not necessarily relating to the peak of the spike to harm, but rather where glucose is at the two hour time point. Your blood glucose will likely spike above the usual cutoff around 140 milligrams per deciliter. But that is likely because you are measuring your blood glucose like 45 minutes after eating or some other time after eating when it should be measured two hours after eating. In addition, these oral glucose tests are controlled and are performed with a set amount of pure glucose, not a mixture of different foods like you likely eat. Okay, so there are several differences, but that's not even the main issue with this interpretation. None of this addresses the crux of the matter. If glucose spikes actually cause health harm, all we have is the relationship of a single glucose test to cardiovascular disease, but it doesn't inform us on if these people continuously spike their glucose or if the uh, impaired glucose test, something above the 140 milligrams per deciliter mark, was caused by general insulin resistance caused by, well, something else. FYI, there are many causes of insulin resistance. And that's where this overzealous enthusiasm for sure answers offered by some influencers is misguided. Because to date, we have no studies that independently isolate glucose spikes and measure over time if these glucose spikes with all other variables controlled, like a randomized controlled trial, actually cause cardiovascular disease. So are we just out of luck? Not quite. I did find some studies that offer us some clues and they happen to be randomized trials. In this study, the researchers put insulin resistant diabetic individuals on one of two drugs. One drug is known to stimulate a quick release of insulin, thereby reducing the post meal glucose spike immediately. And the other drug is long lasting and also stimulates insulin release, but in a more gradual manner, thereby having less of an impact on the immediate glucose spike. The one flattening out glucose spikes is called repaglinide, and the one having less impact on glucose spikes is called gliburide. We can see the evidence here. We see the blood glucose levels on the vertical axis. We see the before using the drug and the spikes are apparent in both groups and similar between conditions. And then we see what each drug does. Both reduce the glucose peak compared to not having the drug. But the repaglinide condition, the one designed to reduce blood glucose spikes, clearly has a greater flattening effect. That tells us the drugs work but it doesn't tell us anything about the outcomes, the actual cardiovascular disease. So let's look at that. Here we're looking at atherosclerosis progression. The individual dots are the individual participants and the boxes are box plots. Essentially, focus on your attention on the middle line in the box and compare the before versus the after. You might notice that only those in the repaglinide the glucose spike squasher, which is what I think they should rebrand it to, showed the improvement in atherosclerosis. Now, it's also important to note that there were no differences at baseline between these two groups. So the effect is likely caused by this drug and not some other variable. That said, there are still some assumptions here, like the fact that repaglinide only affects glucose spikes and nothing else, which is a big assumption. 
But this study offers us some additional clues, which are shared by a few other studies that I analyzed. Like if the glucose spike was possibly more detrimental than the fasting elevated blood glucose and some additional considerations on how to assess your own risk. I'm covering that all in the extended version of this video, which is included in the Physionic Insiders, which also includes many more health-based investigations of mine, if you care to join. You can find the link in the description. Okay, so we've covered a bit on mechanisms. We've discussed one study indicating increased inflammatory markers with glucose spikes. We've covered the epidemiology and how it's falsely interpreted. And we've even covered a randomized, although imperfect, trial indicating that there may be some merit to the idea of reducing glucose spikes, which, by the way, there's another study using a different drug with the same basic idea that also shows these results, but it suffers from the same methodological weaknesses. But let's take this evidence and make sense of it in terms of day-to-day -day living. For one, remember this study this is the one with the increases in the inflammatory markers from the glucose spikes that we discussed. If you didn't notice before, look at the amount of glucose infused in the blood. It's very high, around 15 millimol per liter, or 270 milligrams per deciliter. How often do you expect to have blood sugar that high? I'd guess seldom, if ever. Additionally, the glucose was infused, so, it hit the blood system immediately, not gradually like what you would see when you consume it. Finally, when participants had antioxidants infused with the glucose, look at the data, the same glucose spikes leads to virtually no effect on these inflammatory molecules. So in a shocking turn of events, could context matter? I realized that in the age of social media, we're bent on quick answers and flashy titles, but believe it or not, context might make a world of difference here. So let's add some more. In this study, the researchers monitored blood glucose levels, including spikes over 24 hours in people without insulin resistance, and these are the results on the average amount of time spent in different ranges of blood glucose. So assuming the 140 milligram per deciliter is the cutoff to aim for, which we don't actually know, by the way, less than 1% of your time is spent above that point. That doesn't mean it still can't have negative effects, but considering the studies that we've just looked at have been in spikes that are much, much higher than 140 milligrams per deciliter, if you dip your little teeny weeny teeny tiny toe in above 140 milligram per deciliter water, is that really the greatest concern? So overall, there's some credence to the idea that glucose spikes independently and devoid of context might be a cardiovascular disease risk. Although that's based on a patchwork of data that needs to be filled in significantly. In addition, it seems unlikely that glucose spikes from micronutrient rich foods are a risk, if any risk at all. Plus, we still do not have a set cutoff for what is considered a concerning at glucose spike, which may yet be above 140 milligrams per deciliter. And if your glucose spikes extend well beyond 180 and 200 milligrams per deciliter, there are likely underlying health issues, insulin resistance, that should probably take precedent over focusing on minimizing glucose spikes specifically. And if you're still focused on eliminating them, something as simple as a well-designed low carbohydrate diet can help you achieve that easily. So in short, don't sweat it much. Why didn't I just lead with that? Whoa, what's that? A new video. If you learned here, you will learn a lot there as well.